Welcome to another lab together. Thank you for being my lab partner. And today, we're going to learn a little bit about something that we call TLC. No, not tender loving care. All right, I have TLC for you and I have TLC for everybody. But that's not the TLC that we're actually going to be talking about today. This TLC is going to stand for something called T for thin, L for layer, and C for chroma. Okay, so thin layer chromatography really dates itself back hundreds of years ago. It's one of the first separation techniques that we began doing in a laboratory environment because it was easy and it was cheap. So why not? So TLC, I want to give you a little bit of rundown before we actually start showing you the lab data that we've obtained together. So I'm going to switch the screen for just a second, and we're going to go through a little bit of theory of the TLC plate. All right, so TLC stands for thin layer chromatography. So I first want to talk about what this thin layer really represents. That thin layer means a thin layer of substance. That's why this works. And that thin layer of substance is something that we call silica. Now, it doesn't have to be silica. It can actually be other components. As you can imagine, we've got tons of different versions that are out there. But silica is going to be one of the major ones that we always use in the TLC field. So this means that we're going to be using a very thin layer of silica onto a support and this support backing is either going to mainly be plastic or glass. It's going to be one of these two options. Again, there's other versions that are out there, but these are the two major ones. Well, for our laboratory, I really hate the plastic. Okay, And the reason that I hate the plastic is because the plastic is very flexible when you use it. And I don't want bendy little plates because when you start to bend these plates, you are then going to go and target the silica, which is a very thin layer to begin with, and you can actually disturb it and you can destroy it. So if you're not careful with the handling of the plastic back, TLC plate, then you just ruined yourself in the very beginning. And if you're not careful, and if you don't have an eye for when plates are ruined, you're going to go through this entire process, and at the very end of it, it's not going to make any sense. And that's because you've ruined the plate from step one. So I'm going to save you some time. I'm going to save you some trouble. The problem is that the glass-backed plates are a little bit more money, okay? They're gonna cost much more than the plastic backed plates, but we prefer the glass. And the reason is because as you can imagine, the glass is a little bit more rigid, it's more stiff, there's a better support system there for that really thin layer of silica to be smeared on top of it and not destroyed in any which way possible. All right, so that's kind of what TLC represents. A thin layer of silica, which is SiO2, and that's the support backing of plastic or glass. And that is what supports the silica that we smear onto that surface. Now, in this silica, we often include some type of indicator because the purpose of this is to run something on it, to analyze something on it, and then to be able to see it after the fact. If I can't see it, then we have a problem because I can't do any measurements, and I need to do measurements in the very end. So a lot of times this silica will have a built-in indicator, and this is an F254 indicator. The F stands for fluorescence. So when you put it under the right energy, the right light bulb basically, this uh, compound that you've put onto the TLC plate will interact with the indicator, and you will see something that shows up on your TLC plate. And we'll see that toward the end of this data, but this is what an F254 indicator is in there for. If I do not have F254 indicator, then I will not be able to visually see my spots unless I do a different technique or unless I do something else to it. And I don't want to go through that trouble. 
and everything that we run on this plate is going to uh, interact with the F254 uh, perfectly well. So F254 all the way. Again, it's very common, uh, just like the glass and plastics very common, just like the silica is very common. This is just the traditional way that they come to us, uh, and the most of the time, the way that they're made. All right, so TLC, we've talked about silica, we've talked about the backing. This silica is something that we call a stationary phase. All right, so if something is stationary, what does that mean? Well, I hope that you told me that stationary means it stays put. Okay, it does not move. So what's going to happen is that we're going to have a plate, and it's typically going to be a square or a rectangle plate, and there's going to be a smear of silica all over the front. And the silica is not going to move. It's going to stay there. It's adhered to the plastic or to the glass that we use in the laboratory. So this silica, because it is kind of glued to the backing, it's not going to go anywhere, so therefore we call this the stationary phase. Now the silica structure kind of looks like this. It's S-I-O-S-I-O-S-I-O, -S -I -O -S -I -O. guess what, S-I-O, and I can put dot, 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 and then on this side I can draw an O, and I can put dot, dot, dot. And then the other silicas down here will also have oxygens, so this is why it's an SiO2. Think of this as like water, right? SiO2 or H2O, very similar as far as three atoms that are connected together. There's a center of Si, and then there's two oxygens that come off from that Si, and they begin to kind of link up, all right? So this is the structure of the surface of the silica that we will begin using today. Now the silica will also have another O on them typically, SiO2, and there's linkages of oxygens in between, but the surface of this tends to be somewhat acidified a little bit. So there's hydrogens that are loaded on them. It's not just going to be a free oxygen that's going to be out there. Okay, we're going to take care of that. We're going to give oxygen its needs and we're going to load an H on it. So we actually put alcohol groups on here, don't we? Look at that. Look. Oh, how beautiful is that, right? We talked about this in lecture and now we can actually apply it to lab. So we've got these alcohol groups that are loaded on the surface of the silica plate that we will begin using in the laboratory. So if I ask you a question and the question is, is silica polar or nonpolar? I hope that you can give me an answer to this, right? And again, look how beautiful that was. We learned about this in lecture. We're now applying it to the lab. So what we did in lecture is not wasted time. There's actually an application for all of it. So this silica hopefully you told me, was a polar substance. And the reason is because of all of those electron dots. Look, I've got a pair and a pair, I've got a pair and a pair, I have a pair and a pair, I have a pair and a pair, I've got pairs everywhere. They're all covering the surface of that silica plate. So this is a very polar substance. So we've said like dissolves like. So that means if this is a polar stationary phase, and if I put polar compounds on it, then my polar compounds will love to hang out with its buddy, okay? And it's going to stay there for quite some time. If I put something that's nonpolar on it, and that nonpolar substance goes onto the silica, that is not like dissolves like. They hate each other. They don't get along. So the nonpolar is going to go, eh, and it's just going to move on. And it's going to try to find somewhere where it can fit in. And this is the beginning of the theory of the TELC plate and how it works. All right, so now we're talking about polarity. We're talking about nonpolar. We're talking about silica. We're talking about a little bit of geometry. We're talking about a little bit of organic, right? So there's one part of this that's missing. And this is the piece that's going to go through and actually help these components move through the plate. Well, we just said move, didn't we? We just said move. 
So because of that, we have another term that we need to introduce, and this is called a mobile phase. So chromatography requires two phases, a stationary phase, which is something that doesn't move, and that's our plate, and then mobile phase. So mobile phase, I want you to regard as almost like a solvent, all right? In this case, it's going to be a liquid. It doesn't have to be a liquid every time, but for TLC, it normally is. And what will happen is that we will place our plate down into a container, and that container will have a little bit of mobile phase that's going to be down here at the very bottom. And this mobile phase could also be polar or it could be nonpolar, depending on what I pick, right? I mean, I've got tons of things to choose from to put into the bottom of that container. So that way, when the plate goes in, what we'll see is that this mobile phase will be sucked up through the plate, all right? And over time, this is going to go higher and higher and higher, and hopefully we can get this mobile phase to go up to the top of that plate. And that's how we know that this plate is now finished, all right? It's all based on the size of my plate, how much mobile phase has to be sucked up and so forth. The bigger the plate, the longer typically you have to keep it in there because it's taller and it's going to take longer to suck that mobile phase up through the height of that plate. So you get my drift. If you want to be in the lab for three or four hours, choose huge, huge plates. But if you just want 30 minutes or so, choose little ones. The problem here, though, is that you have to choose a plate size that will make sure that separation actually occurs. If you choose too small of a plate, you will not give these components time to separate fully like they should, and your calculations are not going to make any sense. If you choose huge plates in the very end of this experiment, you'll wait forever and ever and ever, but you will guarantee that your measurements will work out the proper way. So it's almost like a Goldilocks routine here, right? Too hot, too cold, just right. Well, what we like to use in our lab is a 20 by 20 centimeter plate. These are slightly on the larger side. However, I can get all of my components that I need to inject onto the plate in one plate. I don't need to use multiple ones. I keep everything more consistent. They are a little bit bigger. I have to wait a little bit longer on them. But folks, when I say a little bit longer, I'm talking here typically an hour to an hour and a half. After an hour to an hour and a half, this plate will be finished because my mobile phase will be sucked up to the top of that TLC plate. All right, now let's think about something before we go further. I just said that the silica on the plate is polar, right? So what would be the purpose of using a polar mobile phase? Well, the answer to that is there's not one. Okay, if I use a polar mobile phase and I have a polar stationary phase, then these components that I begin to put onto the plate, I'm going to represent these as little circles, they get confused. They don't really know where to be. Do I go with the polar stationary phase? Do I go with the polar mobile phase? Well, that really depends on my structure. That depends on what type of groups that I have onto my compound. That really depends on the types of structures and the types of polar compounds I have in my mobile phase. Well, it, there's, you know a choice here for these compounds to go. However, I can clearly give these compounds a distinct choice, and that distinct choice is if I use something that's nonpolar. So I can clearly make these compounds make a decision of being either in the polar stationary phase or the nonpolar mobile phase. Now the problem here is that most of the time, only polar, it doesn't quite work. And that's because these compounds 
are constantly choosing between the two polars that they want to be with. And I don't really get good separation like that sometimes. All right. If I choose only nonpolar, I don't get good separation there either most of the time. And the reason is because these compounds will look at nonpolars and say, I hate you. And they will stay on the polar stationary phase and they won't move because they don't want anything to do with that nonpolar substance. So very often what we find ourselves doing is doing a mix of the two. So that way we change the dynamic. We make this choice easy, but not too easy where it really doesn't give me any kind of measurable data in the very end. All right, so that's the purpose of the mobile phase. Today, we are using a stationary phase that is silica-based. And then in this lab, we're going to give you three mobile phases to do. One is going to be something that we call ethyl acetate, and it's ethyl acetate only. That might work. We don't know until we run it and see. And then we're going to use something that we call hexane, and it's going to be hexane only. And once again, that might work. We don't know. That's the purpose of doing it. And then the next one is going to be a 50-50 mix. That means half ethyl acetate and half hexane. So we'll mix that up together. We'll put both of those mobile phases into the chamber and we'll allow those components to make a decision on what they want to do. At the end of this lab experiment, what will happen? What do we see? Well, we'll see a plate and there'll be a starting line where I'll put my spots. And my spot, hopefully, will travel up, my component will travel up the plate so far. And then there'll be a finish line up here. And this will be the area where my mobile phase stops. All right, so this is the finish. My mobile phase will get sucked up through the plate and it will continue to travel up, 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 up until I take it out. All right, so there's my finish line. I do not want my components to go all the way up here to this finish line. Okay, that's not a very good separation. That means they're, they're too soluble in my solvent and my mobile phase, and they travel with my mobile phase, and I guarantee you I will not be able to get good data from that type of plate. So I want my components to lag behind a little bit. So what I would see if I'm spotting, in this case, four different components, I'll see four different spots. They might be different heights, and if so, that's very good. And then I'll have an unknown that will also uh, run and analyze as well. So at the end of this lab, what we'll end up doing is that we will calculate something that we call a retardation factor. Okay, now I've got to say something here. Retardation factor has been used for a number of years, and we've just assumed that we'll keep calling it retardation factor. But some people have been offended by this term. So retardation factor, we abbreviate it as RF. And then we call it RF factor. That's what the R stands for. It's what it stood for for years and years and years and years. Instead people turned around and said, this is not an appropriate term for you to use. So we had to go back to the drawing board and we had to whack the retardation factor off and we had to substitute that with something else. So we no longer call it the retardation factor. We now call it the retention factor. So it means the same thing but if you do Google or you do some kind of Wikipedia search, there is a chance that you will see both of these terms used interchangeably still, and they mean the same thing. However, retention still starts with an R, so we can still call it the RF factor. So the RF factor is something that I have to calculate. All right. So the way that I calculate the RF factor here in the very end of this experiment is I'm going to take a ruler. I know, very scientific, right? But in a real lab, we have equipment that will automatically analyze and measure and everything for us. But here, we're going to take a ruler, and I will measure the distance between the start line all the way up to the point 
of which the spot has occurred. All right, and I typically measure this in centimeters. I can measure it in inches. I can measure it in millimeter. That really matter. I don't really care. Just be consistent with it. You'll still get the same RF factor in the very end. All right, so that's going to be my first measurement that I do. That's what we call the spot distance. All right, and then I'll start from that same starting line and I'll go all the way up to the top of where that mobile phase ended in that lane. So keep in mind that this mobile phase line could be a little crooked. So you want to go right above the dot and you want to measure how high that mobile phase has risen on your plate. So this is what we call our um, mobile phase distance. And I abbreviate mobile phase as MP. So don't get that confused with melting point. But MP also stands for mobile phase. And it's the mobile phase distance measured in centimeter. So to calculate RF, what I'll do is I'll take my spot distance and I'll divide it by the mobile phase distance. And that's it. That's the only calculation that you have to do for this lab. It's as easy as that. All right. Again, I do them all in centimeter. That's just the way that I've trained myself. That's the unit that I like, and it works for me. So hopefully it will work for you. But that unit can change depending on what type of ruler and what you prefer. But centimeter is typically the one that's reported. Okay. So this will give us a RF value. I also want to say that if there are multiple spots, because this could happen, all right? So I've spotted a component, and maybe I can get two spots out of it. Well, we calculate an RF for this one, and we also calculate an RF for that one. And we report both, and we assign both RFs to that particular compound. So that's not a problem that sometimes is a very common occurrence and this is a sign that this is an impure compound all right so typically if you're using a pure compound that should have one spot because it's one component but even things that we order in a lab sometimes is not 100 percent pure it rarely actually ever is so there is a chance that we will see multiple spots throughout this thing all right however this multiple spot could also come from contamination. It's contamination on your end. So when you begin to spot these plates, you could accidentally drip, drip, drip onto the plate if you're not careful. You could forget to switch your capillary tubes. That does the spotting in the very beginning, and you could cross-contaminate those. So sometimes the multiple spots is due to your technique in a laboratory, but sometimes it's just simply due also to the component that we have in our lab. Okay. Uh, another thing I want to say about RF is that RF uh, is not specific. Okay, uh, We cannot calculate an RF of something and automatically say, yes, I'm 100% sure that that's what that thing is. Uh, that's not the way it works. We don't have textbooks of RF for that reason as well. Uh, typically what happens here is that we do the same thing in the lab over and over based on the things that we study, and we uh, get accustomed to various RFs that work for us. But my RF might not be the same as your RF if you're doing it in a different lab with a different plate with different solvents and so forth. Uh, in addition to that, you got to keep in mind that uh, hundreds of thousands of chemicals um, are in existence that are suitable for TLC. And just because one of these goes up to RF of a certain value does not mean that another one that is very chemical related goes up to the same RF value, right? If these two compounds have similar characteristics, similar polarity, similar non-polarity, similar functional groups, but they are still different compounds, then they could have the same or similar close enough RFs where they are indistinguishable between each other uh, in a typical normal lab that we'll do today. All right. So just keep that in mind. Uh, you know, there's tons of different choices that are out there and we could have an overlap of RF values for that reason. That's also why we do other tests, right? We do other tests in a lab. So TLC is just one of those confirmation tests. And then we can turn around and do things like boiling point and solubility 
density, and I can run it on other pieces of equipment as well. All right, so that's a little bit of intro to TLC. So uh, 25 minutes worth of a background for you on what a plate is, what does TLC stand for, what is stationary phase, what is mobile phase, and what kind of calculations do we do with it, and now we know that's called a RF factor. All right, so here is going to be a TLC chamber that I decide to use in our lab. Uh, we go fancy here. You know, we spend hundreds of dollars onto TLC tanks, and that's because we have very large plates that we like to run most often, and I don't really settle for beakers. Uh, if you're doing this in a normal, like, organic lab with a larger class, they probably will pull out the beakers on you and tell you to put aluminum foil over the tops, and I just think that's kind of skanky, and I don't like it. So here is Real Life Lab, and this is a TLC chamber, an appropriate TLC chamber, and I pulled out three of these because the lab tells me to run one ethyl acetate, one hexane, and one 50-50 mix. And I can, of course, put all of those into the same tank. So I brought out three of these chambers, and I'm getting ready to bring out three plates as well. So this is a TLC plate. Uh, for size reference, you can see my wad of keys that are up here in the very top. So these are pretty large. Uh, they're 20 by 20 centimeters. So they are a square plate, and it does have a glass backing um, on them. So again, I told you I like the very rigid ones. I don't like for people to grab a hold of these and bend and have them become flexible. It just damages the surface of the plate, and I don't like that. So on this surface, this white stuff that you're seeing on the plate, all of this is SiO2. So a very polar stationary phase that's applied to that plate. Uh, if you want to know the box that they came from, here they are. So here's the TLC silica gels or silica plates. Uh, notice it gives me the dimensions are here, 20 by 20 centimeter. And it also says that it has the F254 indicator on it as well. That F254 indicator is nothing more than just a zinc silicate compound. That's all that it is. So they mix this in with the silica and then they smear it onto the glass or plastic backing and let it dry. So the F254 is already in there. So that means at the very end of this, when I go to image the plate, it's going to show up something. And I hope that it shows up something very well and very clear. All right? Okay, so 25 in a case, it looks like here. These 25 typically cost me about $150 to $200. So they are not cheap at all, period. And we try to use them whenever we can. We want to make sure that when we do use them, that we don't damage them anymore. And we try to go through and we try to make sure that we prevent some of those common mistakes that most people do when it comes to plates. And that's not not thinking beforehand. So I'll talk about what I mean by that in just a second. But uh, here is the box of silica plates that we've decided to use here. All right. Uh, of course, the smaller they go, the cheaper that they are, but the more that you have to use. So in the long run, is it really worth it? Well, not for us. So we've just decided to use the big ones instead. To spot my samples onto this plate, uh, I need something that we call a capillary tube. So here is a capillary tube, and they are not melting point tubes. All right. So here's the difference. Melting point tubes are very long and narrow, just like capillary tubes are. But they have a closed end at the bottom. All right, and that closed end is to hold your solid sample, so that way you can do a melting point on it. A capillary tube is open on both ends. So this is something that a lot of people have mistakes with because sometimes both of these are swirling and swimming around in our lab and they're grabbing the wrong container. So a capillary tube is opened on both ends. Think of it just like a straw. That's what these are. And just like a straw, you can suck liquid up into the straw, and you can put your finger on top, and it holds all the liquid on the inside, doesn't it? Well, capillary tubes allow you to do the same thing. Melting point tubes do not. So we need both ends open in order for this to work. All right, so before I do any prep at all, I'm going to come around, and the directions tell me to take your plate and measure at least one centimeter up from the bottom of your plate. 
and you're going to do that all the way across and you're going to draw a line. So what I'm doing here, you can see this is a pencil. And the reason I use a pencil is because if I use pen, pens have ink, right? And the ink is organic and the ink is soluble in the solvents almost every single time. And what you will see is that the ink pen will smear and it will run all the way up the TLC plate. And you have just ruined the plate because you've marked it with a pen instead of a pencil. So this is why we stay away from the pens, folks. We do not take pens into a TLC laboratory. They will look at me with shame and they will run me out of the lab. All right? So we always use pencil and I do one centimeter up. And as you can tell, I have drawn that line one centimeter from the bottom all the way across, all right? And this is gonna represent my starting line, okay? This is where I'm going to start my spotting a little bit later on, but this is my starting line for all of my components. Uh, I told you about damage, so here is the first plate that I pulled out of the box. Uh, none of the plates are gonna be perfect, all right? And all of these sides are identical. So I did not start and flip the plate on this side because I see this big smudge that's right there. And if I begin to allow solvent to travel up from the bottom this way, then this big old smudgy spot is going to affect the separation, and I don't want that to happen. I also, for that reason, same reason, chose not to use this as my bottom. And that's because I also saw a damaged area that's right there as well on the plate. So if this was my bottom and my mobile phase began to suck up through that beaker, then this is going to affect the separation, all right? I'm not gonna be able to suck up that mobile phase the appropriate way and make it evenly all the way across the board. So down here at the bottom, if you see, there's no damage, right? And this is one of the reasons that I chose this side to be the bottom. So you can't see it from the picture, but I've got my starting line basically marked off down here at the very bottom. And now I need to go through and I need to make sure that I evenly space out what we call our lanes, our lanes that we spot our compound in. And typically what I do is I start from the edge and I measure about two centimeters over and I put a mark and then I do another two and put a mark and then another two and put a mark and then another two and put a mark and so forth. And these are gonna be starting lanes for me to put my sample components on. However, some of these I'm not gonna use. And the reason is because if my mobile phase travels up this way, and it will, because this is where my starting line is, if I spot something in this lane and it hits this damaged area of the plate, then all of a sudden my separation's ruined. So this is something that I don't wanna do. So I'm going to not use that very first lane for that reason, and you'll see that when I begin to spot on the plate, and I'll show you some pictures of that. The same thing's gonna happen over here to the side. Again, I'll measure two centimeters from the end, and I'll spot two centimeters, spot two centimeters, spot, and so forth. If I use anything in this area, and my spot begins to travel up, 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 and it hits this damaged area, then that damaged area is gonna prevent it from going any further. And I might need to get it further, and I don't want that to happen, and I'm not gonna take the risk. So some of these I will sacrifice, and it's based on the damage that I see onto the plate. This is what I referred to earlier ago. When I said that people don't actively think when they get their plates and when they get, begin to mark them, this is what I'm talking about. They're not thinking about what side should I start with, what side is damaged, where do I not spot to make sure that I don't get any interference later on. All right, here's another plate that I took out that I decided to use. Uh, this one's pretty good. Uh, this smudgy is just really from the camera. It's not from the plate. But notice that here we also see a damaged area. So, of course, I'm not going to put this as my bottom, right? And the reason is because there's a damaged area of the silica right there. It flaked off. And if I chose that to be the bottom and my mobile face sucked up this way, that spot is going to prevent the uh, capillary action from happening uniformly all the way across this plate. So I chose the bottom here for my bottom. And then as long, and I know this is kind of a spot area, it might be a spot area, but as long as I stop the mobile phase from that 
area right there and I don't let it go any further, it's not going to affect my separation because this is pretty much on the end. So as long as I catch my mobile phase and as long as I make sure my mobile phase doesn't venture into that damaged area, then I'm perfectly okay. The issue here is that these damaged areas were a little bit further down the plate. So I needed it go up further than that. I knew that from the very beginning. So that's why I stayed away from those areas and I did not spot anything at all uh, on that plate in that particular type of location. Okay, so let's take a look at our components now that we're going to have to use and spot onto the plate. And the very first one that the lab directions tell me to use is 4-acetaminophenol, a.k.a. Tylenol. You can probably say that a little bit easier, can't you? Or it also goes by acetaminophen, or it also goes by paracetamol. All right, so it goes by a multitude of different names, and this is okay as long as that one name represents one compound, and that's it. So in other words... If I look at this name in organic chemistry, is the only way that I can draw a structure for that name and end up with this down here? If the answer is yes, then it's an appropriate name for that compound. If the answer is no and it's too ambiguous and I can give you different ways to draw that structure based on what you've wrote down onto a sheet of paper, then that name is not going to work for me. So this is for acetaminophenol or acetaminophen. We've not talked about the nomenclature of yet, and that's okay. However, there are parts of this that I want you to pick out. And one part of this name is the OL. So we've talked about in lecture now that OL stands for alcohol. So again, we're applying lecture technique to laboratory. If you look at the word Tylenol, something else that I would like for you to take away is the OL ending. What do you think that OL ending means? Ding, 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 ding. If you said alcohol and now you know, all right? So knowings is half the battle. See, I'm an 80s child that's coming through, isn't it? All right, so Tylenol, alcohol, group, where is that alcohol group, and that alcohol group is right here, the OH group. So there is the structure for Tylenol. Something I want to talk about here, I want you to start thinking about polarity. I want you to start thinking about free electrons and which ones are more polar, which one's nonpolar. Uh, the uh, Tylenol structure, we know that this oxygen has to have a free set of electrons here. We also know that the nitrogen has to have a free set of electrons in order to get, because it has three bonds. Uh, this oxygen also has two sets of electrons. So this is something that I want you to pay attention to as I show you these structures structures and the four structures that we're going to be using in this lab experiment. So here's the first one and we got four acetaminophenol. All right and the next one caffeine and notice too this is ordered here's the jug it's from Alpha Asar if you need to know that manufacturer name and the lot number is 101397348 but take a look at this it's 98 percent pure it's not 100 percent pure. I told you didn't I? I told you that these compounds that we order sometimes are not 100% pure. And actually, I say sometimes, but very often, they're not 100% pure. Next one's caffeine. We use caffeine quite a bit in our laboratory, and I don't want our stock caffeine bottle to be contaminated by people. So what we do is that we take out some portions of caffeine, and we put them into these containers or to these bottles here. Uh, for that reason, if we were doing this in a lab experiment, for say, uh, this would be labeled as stock. We would say there's no manufacturer name, there's no lot number. It comes to me in this kind of container. So this is just a stock container of caffeine. I don't know where it comes from, and that's the word that I write down in a lab notebook if I have to do that. Uh, the caffeine structure up here in the top right hand corner, this is the way that caffeine looks. So again, think about free dots here. So this oxygen I know has two sets. The nitrogen's got some sets because look, it's got three bonds, right? This oxygen also has some sets. That nitrogen has a set. These nitrogens have a set. I mean, there's free dots everywhere. So if I had to compare the difference between caffeine and Tylenol or acetaminophen, what I would see is that caffeine is going to be more polar. So now automatically I can start making decisions on how these things will behave on the TLC plate. Because if I have a TLC plate that has SiO2, well, if I have spotted caffeine on it, caffeine is going to like to hang out with SiO2 a little bit better than my Tylenol or acetaminophen. And the reason for that is because caffeine's more polar. So if it likes to hang out with the caffeine 
and the silica, it's going to stay lower on the plate because it doesn't have a tendency to move up. There's no need for it to move up. It likes where it is. So it might eventually get pushed out. It might eventually start to migrate a little bit. But the issue here is that caffeine really does like that SiO2 compared to a compound like Tylenol, who is polar and likes to hang out with silica. But at the same time, it's not as polar as caffeine. So now we can start thinking about the order of what we call elution or the separation that begins to occur between these components. And now you see the purpose of TLC. Uh, here's acetyl salicylic acid. This is also called aspirin. Again, this is a stock container of acetyl salicylic. And that stock container uh, has a structure that's over here to the bottom right hand side. Again, take a look at the groups, take a look at polarity, take a look, hey, we got an alcohol group at least I know of at this point, right? And that might be all that we've talked about. Uh, in addition to this, though, I see a double bond OOH. We also called this a carboxylic acid, didn't we, in very the first lecture? And we said carboxylic acids have a pKa value. And I should kind of know that range of pKa value. Look at that. It's coming back. I told you it's a buildup process. All right, uh, so that I'll continue on. So there's our third component that we're going to be using. And our fourth component is going to be ibuprofen. So ibuprofen is going to come from a company called Acros Organics. Uh, the lot number here is A0358724, and it is 99% ibuprofen. Again, not 100%. It's too expensive for us to order completely pure stuff. All right, so ibuprofen structures over here to the left. Uh, notice compared to some of the others, this is not as polar. It's probably some of the most non-polar compounds that we have out of the four choices that we're running. That's because the only area that is anywhere polar is going to be this right in here. All right, the COOH. And I don't want you to get confused that COOH is a condensed version to write C double bond OOH. This is COOH. That's what that means. So this is a carboxylic acid that we have on this end. So we know that that does have some polarity associated with it. The oxygens have some free pairs of electrons, but it's not as polar as some of the other groups that we see. All right, so out of the lab directions, it's now going to tell me to pull my mobile phases. So these are the solutions that my plates will be uh, dunked down into inside of the chamber. And the very first mobile phase that it tells me to pick is hexane. Well, I hope good and well that you can give me the structure of hexane at this point. If not, then you definitely need to go back and rewatch those lecture videos. All right, so hexane, hex means six. So if I wanted to draw the structure, there's my first carbon, there's my second carbon, there's my third carbon, there's my fourth carbon, there's my fifth carbon, and there's my sixth carbon. All right, so there is hexane. Also notice what it says here. It says N in front. And hopefully you remember that that N stands for normal. And that normal means straight across. And the reason is because hexane can come to me in a couple of different isomers, this being one of them. There's hex there. There's six in total. But this is called iso, and it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, isohexane. Or it's going to be called 2-methyl pentane. Well, the label is going to clearly identify what's inside of this container, and it's in hexane. Another reason that they do this is we also have a bottle of what we call hexanes in the lab. And hexanes is hexane, but it's also all of these other choices, and it's all of the isomers of hexane that might show up as well. So there is a purpose in using that. It's on a different day for a different lab, but this is one of the reasons that they do specifically put in hexane onto this label. It is not hexanes. Hexanes are completely different. There's an S, there's no N. It's a mixture of different compounds. This purely is hexane, and that's it. So Fisher Science Education is the manufacturer, and the lot number is down here at the bottom. If you need it, it's 6GAC15129BLK. All right, so there is the story with hexane. 
So I'm going to take hexane and I'm going to put it into one of my tanks. I'll put a lid on it. And then I'm going to take this hexane. I'm going to make a 50-50 mix. And that will go into a separate tank. Well, what do I make the 50-50 mix with? Well, I make that mix with something that we call ethyl acetate. So here's the picture of ethyl acetate that we used in our lab. Uh, ethyl acetate also comes from Fisher Science Education, and the lot number you can see on that label as well, 9GKC19E03008. So ethyl acetate is going to go into its own tank, and then ethyl acetate is also going to be mixed in with the hexane to make a 50-50 mix. That will go in its own tank as well. All right, uh, so I need to mark my TLC plates. I kind of talked about this already, but here's a picture of me actually doing it. So you can see one centimeter from the bottom. That's my starting line. And then I'm going to go every two centimeters over, and I'll make a tick mark. So you're seeing a tick mark that's here, and then about two centimeters, you're going to see me end up making a tick mark about there. At four, I'll make another one. At six, of course, it looks like I'm off the edge of the plate, and I'm not going to make one there at all. So when I do that, I do that for all three, right? We've got three separate plates. I need to do it for all three. This is what I end up with. There's my tick marks. Well, keep in mind what I told you about the damaged plates. So I looked at all three plates and I said, I think I can be pretty consistent here. I think if I come in from the sides and spot everything closer to the middle and then give it some extra space when I can just to make it symmetry, just to make some uniformity out of it, uh, to make it even all the way across, then I think that I can make these the same way all the way through. So that's exactly what I did. And the lab tells me the way to abbreviate them. So the AC is is going to be for the acetaminophen. The AS is going to be for the acetyl salicylic acid. The C is going to be for caffeine. The I is going to be for ibuprofen. And the U, of course, is going to be for the unknown. So this is the way that I ticked off my plates at the very bottom. And I've assigned to those structures once again, just so that you can compare them all onto the same screen now at this point. And of course, my unknown, I have no clue what it is. So it's probably going to be one of those four, I hope. And it will separate the same way that one of those four will, I hope. And then this way I can help identify what that unknown is going to be. All right. So in the very first chamber, ethyl acetate. So I just took a graduated cylinder. I just filled it full of ethyl acetate. Uh, these tanks typically do not take more than 20 to 30 mils of ethyl acetate in total. So I just transferred that into my TLC tank or my TLC chamber. And you just need a little bit in the bottom. Uh, you know, 20 to 30 mils, it will go a long way. That will be plenty enough for your plate to suck all of that up in. So this is not an issue at all. So you don't want to overfill it. If you overfill it, what will happen is that your solvent will go above this line. And if your solvent goes above this line in the very beginning, then it's going to take these components that you spotted, and these components are just going to fall out of the plate. They're not going to be pushed up the plate, and that's what you need. So when you put the plates down in here, you want to make sure that that solvent doesn't really touch that line that you have spotted your components on. You want the movement to push those components up the plate, and you don't want it to dissolve out in solution because of that. So that's the number one concern that I always have when people begin to start a TLC chamber. So here I put in the the wonderful words of Tammy off of YouTube, Adabadooya, all right? Adabadooya, Adabadooya. So you only need to put in enough mobile phase in the bottom of that chamber so that way these plates can sit in it and start sucking up that liquid over a course of time. Uh, each chamber will have its lid, and this is what the lid looks like. Of course, that lid is in there or, or on the plate to prevent evaporation. We don't want our solvents to change composition over time. So we can put a lid on it, and when we do put a lid on it, uh, it will trap everything inside of that chamber, and it can help ensure that my composition is not changing over time. Another reason that we do a lid uh, in the very beginning, I put the lid on it, is to make sure that the chamber gets fully 
uh, saturate it with vapor. So these things are volatile, which means that they do evaporate quite easily. And I want those vapors to completely fill my TLC chamber. My separation happens a little bit faster that way. My plate sucks up that liquid solution a little bit faster. I know that seems kind of strange, but uh, when we do this, we equilibrate the chamber and that's why we do what we do. All right, uh, here's chamber number two. So chamber number two has nothing but hexane in it. That's it. So again, 20 to 30 milliliters of hexane here in the bottom. And then I put the lid on top and I let that equilibrate before I begin to use it. And then chamber number three is going to have a 50-50 mix of ethyl acetate and hexane. So ethyl acetate and hexane, it's up to you on how much you want to make. Uh, for me, I knew that I didn't need more than 40 right? If I was putting 20 and 30 into each one of the other tanks, then I probably only need 20 to 30 here. But at the same time, I don't want to shortchange myself. I want to make a little bit more than what I need just in case I need it. So 50-50 mix, what I decided to do was a 20-20. So you could have done 10 mils of one, 10 mils of the other. 20 mils of one, 20 mils of the other. 30 mils of one, 30 mils of the other. All of those are 50-50 mixes. But I decided I didn't need any more than 40 mils. I'm not going to be wasteful. So I did 20 mils of ethyl acetate, 20 mils of hexane, and then I dumped that into chamber number three. Uh, notice I'm going to tattle on myself here. This meniscus is not exactly at that 20 mil line, and you can clearly see that. So I really probably need it to go a little bit more. But folks, this is a 50-50 mix. I mean, this is eyeballing. This is not analytical work. So this is pretty close enough. I'm, I'm not going to see any major drastic differences that happen just because I shortchanged myself a fraction of a mil liter on one of these components. So I poured that mix into the third TLC chamber and that's what I see here. And now the next part of my lab directions are going to tell me to make solutions of the knowns. And I'm going to use ethyl acetate as the solvent for those. So the easiest way for me to do this is I just want to go get a spot plate. All right. And the spot, the spot plate will give me different wells that I can put individual components into. And two milliliters of ethyl acetate, these wells are big enough to hold that two milliliters without a problem. So that's exactly what I did, and that's why I did it. Instead of having multiple way boats, instead of having multiple things that I'm going to have to juggle, then why not just pick one, like a spot plate, and do all my sample prep here where it's organized and it's convenient and, uh, you know, it's very easily accessible to me. So I went to the balance. I put the spot plate onto the balance. I teared it out and also noticed that I did a unit change here. My balance is reporting milligrams at this point, not gram. The only thing I had to do is click that button, that arrow, and that will switch the units on our balance. So it went from milligram to gram. So I teared the spot plate. It reads zero milligrams now, and I just want to make sure that my doors are shut before I hit the tear button. That's always a common problem that people don't do. All right, so I'm going to go first to my acetaminophen. The directions tell me to weigh out about 50 milligrams of each. So again, this is eyeballing. It's not quantitative work. There's no numbers, no calculations as far as concentrations go. So as long as I'm close to 50, then I'm good. So here's an image of the acetaminophen or the Tylenol there. Uh, surprisingly, ding, ding, it's a uh, white powder. I mean, that's kind of boring at this point, right? So I put it into one of the wells, and I got 55.9 milligrams. I was happy with that amount, and I moved on to my next one. So my next one was aspirin. Well, surprise, it's a white crystalline powder. Uh, I put that into another well, into the spot plate, and that one read 56.1, and then I re-teared it again to make it read zero. I then went to my caffeine, and with my caffeine, surprise, it's a white powder powder and then I put it into the spot plate and that gives me 44.5. I shortchanged myself on there but that's close enough. I have enough for it to show up and then my next one was ibuprofen and oh surprise it's a white powder and then I go back to this uh, spot plate and I weigh out 46.7 milligrams and then finally I go to my unknown well, if all of my knowns are white powders, it's not surprising that my unknown will be a white powder. And this white powder was weighed out into one of the wells as well. 
and then that weight was a little higher than some of the others. It was 65.8, but I told myself that's close enough. I don't need any more or any less than that. That will work. It will give me a spot that I need to visualize and see. So the next part of the lab experiment is going to tell me to dissolve each of these. Uh, now, it says dissolve. It doesn't say that these will fully dissolve. It just says add the solvent to each one, mix it up, stir it up, and dissolve as much as possible. Okay? So I'm going to take two milliliters of ethyl acetate. It does not have to be perfect, so that's why you're seeing me use one of these plastic disposable pipettes here. Each one of these, there's markings on the pipette. You can kind of see that here and way up here at the top and that gives me an idea of what one milliliter is. So I add two milliliters of ethyl acetate using a disposable pipette into each one. All right, so here is the order of which I did them. Uh, up here at the top, this is my Tylenol structure, right? And then down here, in, I'm, I'm going to say uh, here's one. Here I'm going to say lane number two. Uh, this is my caffeine structure. Uh, up here at number three, this is my aspirin structure. Uh, four, it looks like there's nothing in it, but there is. That's ibuprofen. And then number five down here at the bottom, this is my unknown. So that's why there's question marks behind it. Okay, so here's the story at this point. If you tell me, if you tell me that your unknown is ibuprofen, which is in spot number four, I'm, I need to slap you. All right. And the reason is because I want you to look at this. It can't be number four. Number four fully dissolved without a problem. Ibuprofen, when I hit it with the ethyl acetate, completely dissolved to a point that it looks like that well is empty. And my unknown did not do that, did it? So not even making it to the TLC plate at this point. I do not want you to tell me that ibuprofen is your unknown. If so, I should just automatically put an F on your lab grade and give it back. So I'm already eliminating one of those choices from you. I want you to actively think through these lab steps. And that is an active thinker right there because they automatically are going to tell me it can't be number four. It can't be ibuprofen. It's either going to be the Tylenol or the aspirin or the caffeine because those stayed somewhat white crystalline powders and they didn't fully dissolve. And that's how my unknown worked as well. So do not give me ibuprofen as the unknown identity. All right. So next, acetaminophen with the ethyl acetate. I zoomed in a little bit closer so you could see this well. That way you can make your observations as you see fit. The acetyl salicylic acid with ethyl acetate, the zoom in is right there. Again, you can take a look at that and tell me how it looks to you. Here's the caffeine with ethyl acetate. Once more, I zoomed in so you could take a closer look of how this is behaving. The zoom in of ibuprofen, it's a little bit out of focus, but I don't think that you need it in focus fully. Here's ibuprofen with ethyl acetate, completely different than the other three. And then here's the unknown with the ethyl acetate. So once again, you can eliminate one choice based on how it's observing at this point in time. And now you've got a 33% chance of identifying the unknown the proper way. All right, so now we've got to go through and we've got to spot these plates. So down here at the very bottom, you know, I've ticked these off with tick marks and I've labeled each lane the way that they need to be. And I took a capillary tube and I took the capillary tube. You can kind of see that one here in the bottom. I just dunked it down into that solution. Some of the liquid sucked up into the capillary tube. And now I just need to dab it onto that plate at that particular location. So one little drop, that's all that you need for this thing to work. How big? This big. That's it, folks. Go tiny. So one little drop, very quick, very fluid motion. You don't want to just hold the capillary tube there. You want to make this a very quick prick. And you should see a spot that forms on your plate that looks like this. And I was very happy with it. Let me tell you why. This spot that I see, the diameter of the spot is not very large. Okay, The smaller this spot gets, the better uniform the spot's going to be in the very end. In other words, I don't want to see smears. I want to see spots at the very end of this. And one of the reasons that I would see a smear is I've put too much. So as this component travels up the plate, it's not going to travel together. There's going to be some lag. 
some of it's going to stay behind. And I get this real long smeary thing that begins to happen on my plate, and I don't really want to see that. I can do measurements with it, but it's not ideal. All right, so that's the kind of shape that you're after on the TLC plate. You want something very small. You want something that looks like a circle, for goodness sakes. And you want something that's very uniform all the way around. So I spot one little drop. That's it. I take it away. I go on to my next one. This is the AS lane. And then I spot one on the AS lane. And look, when I do that, my spot that's over here has disappeared at this point. It's already dried. That's how fast these things will dry on you. So once you do one little dab there, you move on to the C lane, you move on to the I lane, and so forth. Here, however, I made a mistake. I made a boo-boo. All right, and the boo-boo that I did, I was like, oh, I'm switched. I got a little too excited. I got a little too excited in the lab prep and taking pictures and taking videos for you that I switched two of the spots around. So I made that correction onto the plate here. So what was acetyl salicylic acid was crossed out. That's caffeine. I switched those. Those are the two I switched. And then what was caffeine, I crossed that out and I wrote AS on there. All right. So again, you have to make sure that when you write on them with a pencil, you don't scrape anything off. Again, I'm going to tattle on myself because it does look like I scraped a little bit when I wrote the A here. But that's okay. Hopefully that will not interfere with my spot as long as my spot goes there. All right, so let me show you a video of what we've done together at this point because you might be able to see it a little bit better for those different types of visual learners that we have in our class. Okay, folks, so this is the TLC plate that you're seeing in the screen right now. And the TLC plate has been marked down here at the very bottom. You can see my starting line one centimeter up from the bottom. I really don't want to touch this plate over the surface, but I do want to look for damages, and I see damages up in the very top. And I want to stay away from those if I can. So that's the way that I have determined how to spot and where to spot onto the plate down here at the bottom. I want to stay away from those smudges that are showing up at the top of the plate. Over here is our spot plate. So I've dissolved a little bit of crystal with some ethyl acetate into each one. I gave it a good stir. And I put these really small capillary tubes inside of each spot well. And then this capillary tube is like a straw. It sucks up that liquid and it holds it for me. And then I just take this capillary tube and I just give it a little dab. That's all that you need. So I did one dab for each one. I let it dry. And then I come back after it's dry and I redo it a second time, sometimes a third time if you think that you don't have enough of it. So now I'm getting ready to take my plate and I'm getting ready to put it into the TLC chamber that's back here in the back. Uh, these things are super heavy. It's very thick wall. Uh, we put a lid on it to prevent evaporation from the solvent, but that is the TLC chamber that we will put our plate inside of. And then we just let it hang out for a little bit until it gets finished. All right, folks, so thank you for helping me set up those three TLC chambers. I appreciate all your work and everything that you do, but let's be honest with each other, right? If you were in a lab and you were taking this in a larger class, you would probably have lab groups, and there's a chance that people in that lab group would do some of the work, and some people would not do any of the work. So that's the way that I'm going to think about this. It's just a lab group together, right? So we are sharing the data and experiences together, and that's how I'm going to to view it. All right, so June the 11th at 1.30 p.m., I then take my plates that I have just spotted and let dry, and I put them into the tank. So this is what they begin to look like. So this is the very first tank, and as you can see, the level of the mobile phase is down here, all right? And quickly, it has begin or it has begun to suck up that mobile phase inside of that chamber so i'm already seeing migration that's beginning to happen so this is tank number 1 which is just ethyl acetate this is tank number 2 that is my uh, simple hexane only and then here is tank number 3 which is my 50/50 mix of hexanes and ethyl acetate uh, you know i keep saying ethyl acetate I want to go back for just a second, and I want to talk about that name, and I want to talk about that structure. 
Uh, ethyl acetate, ethyl, you know what that means, all right? Ethyl is CH3 and CH2, all right? Uh, the acetate group, though, you do not want, know what that means yet. Uh, the acetate group is an ester group. So this is a carbon with a double bond O and an O. This is what we call ester. And whenever we IUPAC esters, we add the word eights onto them. All right, so that's what that is going to represent. And acete, anytime we see acete in organic, this is a common term, and that common term means a two-carbon chain. So CH2, CH3. Almost think of it like ethyl, all right? Okay, so the way that we look at this with ethyl acetate, it looks like we have the ester group on the structure. And then acete represents a two-carbon chain, and then ethyl represents a two-carbon chain. So this is going to be the structure for ethyl acetate. So please keep in mind, later on in the future, and maybe in a different organic class if you're asked to name esters, that that carbon does get included in the carbonyl, the C double bond O group. So that is a extra carbon that gets included into that name. So that's where the acetate comes from or the ethyl comes from, depending on what name that they use at that appropriate time. All right. So there's my ethyl acetate. Okay. So now at 133, so a couple of minutes later, like three minutes later, I go back and I take more pictures for you for each of the TLC tanks. And this is what I see. Notice how fast it moved up. Right? So here is the first tank. This is ethyl acetate. Here's the second tank that has my uh, hexane in it. And here is my third tank that has the 50 50 mix in it. So three minutes later, it goes from basically this level to this level. And again, you might look at this and you might think this is moving pretty fast. All right, this is not going to take an hour and a half. What's he talking about? Well, at 144, I then go back and take more pictures for you. So now we are about 10 minutes after, or 15 minutes after the very first dunk. 15 minutes later. And what it looks like now, here's my first one, here's my second, and here's my third. The reason I'm doing this is I'm showing you that it does slow down over time. The higher the liquid level goes, the slower it's going to move. The capillary action is actually affected more and more and more and more. So if I go back and quickly do a comparison, this is the initial. Three minutes later, it goes here. Ten minutes later, it doesn't move up quite as much. Okay, so what you're seeing right now is the TLC plate in the TLC chamber, and it's beginning to suck up all of the liquid that's down here in the very bottom. And in the beginning, it goes super fast, right? You would think that this process would only take five minutes by the time it reaches the top. But the problem is the capillary action. Over time, as the plate sucks up more and more liquid, it takes slower and slower in order to get to the top of this plate. So the lab directions tell me to allow this sol solvent to suck up the TLC plate all the way through until it gets to about one to two centimeters from the top. And uh, that's gonna take a while. So I'll just kind of hang out and let this thing do its thing. And then I'll come back in a 30 minutes or so and see how far along it's gotten. All right, folks, so that was at 1.44 p.m. Uh, then I went back at two o'clock and I took another set of pictures for you just so you can see how far it traveled. Are we getting closer? So at two o'clock, now remember we started this process about 1.30. So at 2 o'clock, 30 minutes later, here's tank 1. Oh, here's tank 2. I just had my hopes up. Here's tank 3. And it barely even moved, right? Okay, so from 144 here all the way to 2 o'clock, which is here, that's how far that it moved up that plate. 
I told you, didn't I? I told you that this separation was going to take about an hour to an hour and a half. In the beginning, it misleads people. But the longer it stays in there, the higher it travels, the slower it goes. Finally, at 241, so a little longer than one hour after our initial start, this is what I see. Here's plate number one. So plate number one, I can clearly see the mobile phase line. And that mobile phase line, that wetness, basically looks like it has made its way up here to the top. One to two centimeters from the top. And that's pretty good. So that's ready to be taken out. So I take the lid off of that chamber. I take the plate out. I lay it down onto my lab counter with the silica side up so that way it can dry. But the very first thing that I want to do is mark the finish line. I know this picture is kind of out of focus, but you can see the dividing line here between the dry silica and the wet. So I'm going to take a pencil yet again. And I'm going to go through and I'm just going to draw all the way across the top of that plate so that way I know where this has traveled to. Notice the damages over here to the side. That's not a problem. And that's because I didn't spot anything in those areas. Everything was away from those areas. So this way when the solvent dries and my silica plate dries, it will go back and it will look like it did in the very beginning. I've at least marked the area where my mobile face has went. If I do not do this, if I do not mark the mobile phase line when I took the plate out, I'm not going to be able to do any of the calculations in the very end. So that's something that you have to do. Don't forget about it. Because without that mobile phase distance, you're not going to be able to calculate the RF factors, are you? Because that's a required distance for that calculation. And you have to do it all over again. And I don't want to do it all over again. So I made sure that I marked those lines up at the very top. All right, so the next plate I took out was plate number three. All right, so that was plate number one that you just saw. That one was done first. Plate number three was the next one in line. This one was a little further away from the top, but it's toward the top enough. So I went to plate number three, which was my 50-50 mix. I took that plate out as well. You can clearly see the wet silica versus the dry silica. Then I took a pencil and I marked that mobile phase line as well all the way across. So that way I can do my measurements a little bit later down the road when I need to. And then finally, plate number two was the last one to get ready. So I went back to plate two. And even though I've done this, I do want you to realize that they all pretty much were taken out about the same time. Uh, plate number two was stopped a little bit further down. Remember, this was a damaged area here. I didn't want to include any of that into the thing. So I wanted to go one to two centimeters below that. So that's where the wetness line and the dry line is going to be. So once more, I took my pencil, I just drew all the way across it, so that way we would not lose the mobile phase line at the end. All right, so the next part of the directions told me to take these three plates at this point and take them to a transilluminator or a UV light box. What is a UV light box? It's a tanning bed. Okay, that's what this is. Uh, inside of this box, there are bulbs that go down like this. And those bulbs look just like the tanning bed bulbs if you've ever laid into a tanning bed. Okay, So these bulbs provide UV light energy, just like a tanning bed does. And these bulbs will provide the UV light energy for the F254 indicator because it fluoresces at 254 nanometers. OK, so the UV light box is going to allow this uh, imaging process to take place. It is the right amount of energy that this indicator needs in order for it to do its job. Uh, here to the left hand side there's an intensity. It's a low and a high. And then over here on the right hand side there's a power button that's off and on. Uh, honestly, the high and low is just how bright do you want it to be, pretty much. And of course, you know what the off and on button is going to be. So the way that I operate this sucker is that this lid actually pulls up, right? And it pulls up toward my face because there's a protective screen on it. So that way my eyes do not get burned by the UV light bulbs. Uh, same reason that you wear uh, goggles in a UV light bed or a tanning bed, I hope. 
so you don't want to burn your eyes or damage your eyes. And I also don't want the UV light onto my face, where I will give myself a sunburn within two minutes uh, because, you know, I'm fair-skinned and freckled. So I'm going to get sunburn, and I'm going to get it quick uh, when it begins to happen. All right, so here's the operation of the light box and me putting a plate onto that light box so you can see how that process works. Okay guys, so many people load up the TLC plate the wrong way. Right now the silica is actually on the front side that faces toward me. I'm going to lay the plate down and then this is what most people do because they think this is proper and they'll close the lid to the transilluminator and notice they really don't see anything. I mean nothing really shows up. That's because you've got it in here backward. So I'm going to open the lid back and I'm going to flip the lid over so that way the silica with the indicator is now facing the UV light and you automatically see a difference in the indicator and the plate. So you're seeing a dot here, you're seeing a dot there, it looks like another dot's way up here. Uh, I see something there, I see something there. So it's going to be my job just to circle these wherever I see those dots or spots and then go back and do my measurements. So that's the way to load up the TLC plate on the Transilluminator box. Okay, so what I did is I took some pictures for you, and this is going to be uh, plate number one, and this plate represents ethyl acetate only. All right, so uh, this is the proper way for me to load the plate on the UV light box. Uh, I see a very bright green color, and these dark spots are areas where my component has absorbed the indicator. All right, so remember, F254, fluorescent. This is fluorescent green. That indicator was smeared all over the plate with the silica. So everywhere the silica is at, I get a green fluorescent color. If I have a component that begins to absorb that indicator, I see dark areas that show up. And that's why this process works the way that it does. So what I do while it's on the UV light box is that I take a pen, some type of marker, and I begin to mark and draw the areas that I see things, right? So it's very obvious that these are spots that I need to take in, in consideration. It also looks like I have a couple of humps up in here. I'm going to draw those as well. And then it also looks like uh, I can mark my mobile phase on this line too. So I draw it across with a marker. Down here at the bottom, that's my starting line. So I can see that area show up and I can draw that with a marker. So that way when I take the plate off the lot box everything is labeled and everything is marked I don't need the lot box to do these measurements with it's very aggravating if that's what I have to do so I begin to mark the plates and that's what you're seeing here maybe in a little bit better image so make sure that you mark them clearly uh, make sure that you do the mobile phase line as well as the start line and I even go down here and begin to write the letters in. If I can see those the way that I've labeled them at the bottom, everything is flipped on me, right? Because we flip this plate around backward. So I go through and I do label those lanes yet again uh, because once I take them off the lot box, it's going to be aggravating to keep flipping back and forth to figure out which lane is which. So that is uh, plate number one. You can make your observations based on what you see there. Uh, plate number two, this is what it looked like. Yeah, pretty boring, isn't it? Uh, it looks like all the spots that I did, were it stayed down there at the bottom. And nothing moved. And I kind of alluded to this a little bit early on. So this is just hexane only. That's it, nothing more. And it looks like hexanes didn't do squat to move those spots up that plate. And again, hexane is nonpolar. My silica is polar. And all of these compounds had polar groups on them, didn't they? So did they want to hang out with hexane? Not necessarily. And this proves that they don't. They don't like hexane. They tell it to go away. Shoo, shoo. That's what they tell it to do. All right. At least in my mind, that's what they tell it to do. All right. Plate number three. Here's plate number three. It doesn't look spectacular, but you know, there's dots here. At the same time, not everything traveled up to this line, did it? 
Not everything traveled up to basically the same position like plate number one did. I mean, look at this. I got a spot here, spot there, spot there. They're all spots and they're all the same height. But here in plate three, they traveled away from the start line, but they didn't go all the way to the top at the same distance. Again, that's something that I'm looking for as far as a proper choice in the mobile phase. All right, so we need to calculate our Fs, and I need to give you those measurements. So I'm going to take these plates off of the lot box, and we're going to start with plate number two. Plate number two is the easiest, and here's why. This is what plate two looked like. This was pure toluene. So what I've done is I've put a ruler up here at the top, and I've enlarged that picture so that way you can see this and make your measurement a little bit better. I'll let you make the measurement on what you read. And then down here at the bottom, that's where all the spots are. Okay, all these spots are basically zeros. They did not move from the start line. This is a very easy calculation for everything across the board. Again, I take my RF and I take the spot distance and I divide it by the mobile phase distance. Well, my spot distance is zero. My mobile phase distance, you write down that number, and zero divided by any number is hopefully, you know the answer to that, and that's the way that you'll report your RF values. All right. Uh, here's just another image of the spots that are down here at the very bottom. Again, they did not move. Not one of them. They did not move. Once I marked the plate and took it off of it, I did not circle anything other than the spots that they started with in the very beginning. All right. Plate number one, ethyl acetate. Ethyl acetate did have some movement. All right. I did see things on the plate. And this overall is what it looked like when I took it off the box. Uh, down at the bottom, you see kind of my smudginess. I'm a left-hander, so I begin to smudge and smear all of my words all across the plate. So I apologize for that. But in this very first lane of you, my unknown, I begin to look up and I see a smear and a circle. All right, so the way that I help identify these compound is I look at these other lanes and do I see anything similar? Do I see another lane that has a smear and a circle? If I do, then this is a very good place for me to start. However, I still need to calculate RF. All right, so it does look like I get two spots here. So this is going to have an RF, and this one will have an RF as well. So I need to take my measurement, and I need to measure. Uh, some people measure the bottoms. Some people kind of go in the middle. Some people measure the top. Uh, I normally go to the tops. That's just the way that I take my measurements with all of the uh, spots on a TLC plate. Somebody might tell you to do something a little bit different, but as long as you're consistent, it, it'll work itself out. The reason I don't do the bottoms is because there is a chance of this thing smearing. So if it did smear, where exactly is the bottom of that huge smear? That's something that I want to stay away from. I don't want to deal with that problem. That's why I never measure from the bottom. The top... Nothing can smear past the top. I mean, that is the highest it has moved. And that's why I normally do the top parts of the dot every time. All right, so I need to measure the distance between my start line, not down here, not down at the bottom of the plate, my start line. I'm going to measure from the start line all the way up to the top of that spot and get a distance. And then I'll measure all the way up to the top of that spot and get a distance. And then I measure to the mobile phase line and get a distance. So I'll calculate the RF here. I'll calculate the RF for that one. And then I will repeat that process all the way through the other lanes. So for lane I, which is ibuprofen, I'm going to go up and I'll measure the distance from the top of that spot to the start line. And then I'll measure the distance that the mobile phase line ran. Okay, and I'll do my calculation, and this will have one RF. And then I'll repeat that process all the way through. So what I did here is that I focused in on one lane for you at a time. So this is the lane U, and there's the ruler over to the left-hand side. And you can pause this if you want to, and you can take a look and read the ruler and give your measurements. Again, you're wanting the top of the spot, the top of the spot, and the mobile phase line. So you can use those numbers to calculate your RFs for the spots that you saw in lane U for plate 1. All right. Uh, here's plate 1, lane I. This stood, of course, for ibuprofen. 
So again, you can pause this on this screen, take a look at your ruler. I think it will show up pretty clear, and you can write down your measurements for the spot and the mobile phase. Here's plate one for acetyl salicylic acid. That showed up in two spots. Again, pause it, take your measurements. That way you'll have them to do the calculation. Here is plate one for lane C. That stood for caffeine. It also showed up in two spots. One was a little bit lower. One was higher. So what I did is that I focused in on this area. I zoomed in so that way you could see that measurement a little bit better. And then I zoomed in on this area and I zoomed in and that way you can see that measurement a little bit better as well. The mobile phase and that second spot both show up pretty well in that last picture. Finally, plate one, lane AC. And lane AC really stood for Tylenol. And it also showed up in two spots. And I think both of those show up pretty well on your screen. So you can make measurements as you see fit. All right, so finally for plate three, which is my 50-50 mix. For plate three, this is what I saw. There we go. I also want to go back and have you to think caffeine we said caffeine was highly polar there was a lot of polar groups that were on that compound didn't we uh, notice where caffeine is at it's down here at the bottom caffeine did not move as far as all the others did well for that reason caffeine likes to hang out with the stationary phase that's a very good sign that caffeine is highly polar because my stationary phase is polar isn't it so like dissolves like, and this is a real-world example of where that comes into play. Why did caffeine not move further up? Why didn't it go further past maybe ibuprofen, which is here? Well, we said ibuprofen was the most nonpolar out of the bunch, right? There was only one group that really had some free pairs of electrons on it. It was the most nonpolar out of the four. Well, ibuprofen hates the silica because silica is polar and ibuprofen is mainly nonpolar. It's not going to want to stay around. So it sees ethyl acetate and it sees the hexanes in the mobile phase and it goes, you know what? I got better grass on the other side. I'm going to keep trucking until I find something that I like a little bit better. So that's why ibuprofen moves the furthest up. It's all about polarity, folks. That's all that it's about. And it's about those groups that you see on those structures for that reason. Okay, so there's the overall picture of the mix, uh, and we'll start with lane U. Uh, lane U to the left, that is the whole lane at once that I took a picture of, and then to the right-hand side, you're going to see the spot that has been magnified here, and then you'll see the ending line, the mobile phase line that has been magnified there. So once again, pause the video, take your measurements, and do your calculations. Plate 3, lane I, this was ibuprofen. Only one spot showed up. You can see both areas that are there. You can read the ruler, make your measurements, do the calculations as usual. Here's plate 3, which is lane AS. That's acetyl salicylic acid. Uh, to the left, you'll see the whole lane at once. So I zoomed in on this area to give you the spot that's here. And then I zoomed in on this area to give you the mobile phase line that's there. So you know what to do with those numbers. Plate 3, lane C, which stood for caffeine. Uh, here, caffeine did not move a lot at all. But over here to the left, you'll see the entire lane. I zoomed in like usual to give you this picture. And then I zoomed in here to give you that picture so you can read the mobile phase and the spot lane maybe a little bit better. And then finally, plate three, which was lane AC. And AC was the Tylenol. All right, so the Tylenol also did a spot that was pretty low. So I zoomed in on this area, and that's what you're seeing here. So that way you can read the ruler a little bit better. And then here is the mobile phase line, and that's over here to the side. Notice this marking here. That's not a mark. That's not a spot. All right. I wrote the word mix, and this is the X of the word mix that I wrote onto the plate. So this is nothing. I want you to forget about that. That is not a smudge. It's not a spot. Nothing showed up in that area. That was just a part of the X from the word that I wrote onto the plate to label it. 
All right, so we have just did this TLC plate lab together. That's really all that you need as far as data goes. So you'll calculate the RFs for each of these components on each of the plates. Uh, once you, or let me rephrase that. You'll pick the plate that's the best out of the three. And then the lab directions will want you to calculate the RFs for all the spots on that plate. Uh, it wants you to ignore the other two that you don't use. Uh, so there you go. There's all of your measurements. There's all of your readouts. If you do decide to use whichever one you need to use as far as the best separation goes, uh, you have the measurements for that particular plate. All right. Uh, so uh, this is not a lab entry notebook. Uh, this is pretty much just a standard fill in the blank, answer the couple of questions, scan it and turn it in. Uh, and that's what this TLC plate lab experiment is all about. Uh, so good luck with the lab data. I don't think that you need luck. I think it's pretty much straightforward. I hope if not, you know how to get a hold of me. You know how to email me. You know my cell phone number. You can send me a text. I don't really care what you do. Uh, if you have a question, that's what I'm here for. Uh, so good luck on the TLC plate. Uh, thank you for showing up to lab at your house. And uh, have a great rest of your day or morning or late night, depending on when you decide to watch this.